Okay, thank you very much and welcome uh, Eric Bueda. I will introduce him briefly. Uh, he is a professor of prehistoric archaeology at the Université Paris 10 um, Nanterre. He is well known for his work on the Neanderthal Levallois technique um, for working stone tools. And uh, this is a research methodology he also uh, adapted to excavation sites in Syria. Um, in 2005, just to mention a few um, things from his career, in 2005 he received the Gay-Lussac Humboldt Prize. Uh, in 2008, he became a member of the Institut Universitaire de France. In 2009, he was awarded the Doctor Honoris Causa uh, of the University Valahia de Targoviste in Romania. And um, he's written many very interesting and uh, to the point of our conference, um, highly relevant publications. And I only want to mention two books um, from 19... 94, Le Concept Le Valois, Variabilité des Méthodes, or 2013, another one, Technologique et Technologie, Une Paléo-Histoire des Objets Lithiques Tranchants. Et alors, c'est un grand plaisir de vous recevoir à notre conférence, Professeur Boeda, et j'attends avec impatience votre présentation. Vous avez la parole, s'il vous plaît. Hello. Thank you for this invitation. Um, my communication will be in two parts. A first part in English, but spoken by French. And the second part, more complex, will be in French. But don't worry, all the PowerPoint is in English, and uh, I hope in understandable English. Um, Based on, on previous communications, I change the title of my communication to be as close as possible to basic materiality. And the title is now Simple Things to Know When Working Over the Long Time Historical Scale More Than Three Million Years. How is our knowledge of the past produced? Our knowledge goes through the perception of traces, which can be seen only through the, their materiality. Knowledge is a form carried by objects. What does long time historical scale impose on us? destruction of perishable material, animal and plant, destruction or disturbance of archaeological sites due to time and climate change. Thus, if we wish to travel the long time historical scale, we must focus on objects with a mineral matter, the only ones to cross this temporality which does not mean that we forget the archaeological context. These objects appear to us by their form, but these forms are the result of gestures that translate also visually by traces on their surface. Instead of staying with the morphological categorization of the artifact, we should ask ourselves about the significance of the traces and their technical functional consequence. We can then substitute the word traces with the word memory. But what memory are we talking about? The anthropogenic traces left on an artifact are the support on an epiphylogenetic memory. The epiphylogenetic memory of an object is the fruit of experience, an individual memory that of the knowledge of the gestures that produced and made possible the operation of the object, but also the fruits of a transmission by a group of 
uh, heritage of a culture, etc. Let us dare to use Bergson Cohn to illustrate my talk. The epiphylogenetic memory that reflects a double genesis. That of his own existence and that of his existence in becoming. And the point, for example, this is a yellow point, is uh, the object in the temporality of its discovery and its speciality. But the long time scale force us to become aware of four essential points in the construction of the knowledge. First, what are the consequences of long time historical scale on the memory that we can extract for the traces? Second, we know that an object does not exist on its own. It is an element of an external environment which allows it to exist. In other words, it is a being who exists only among its peers. Three, how to get to this memory other than by technique. Four, we are fa faced with a double constraint, the double ego, ego, the ego of prehistoric man and woman, and the ego of the prehistorian. First, what are the consequences of the long time historical scale on the memory we have on the traces? We have a present memory after when we go down, we have a parcel memory and uh, often we have forgotten memory. If I translate it, I change the picture. It's like the cheese. At the beginning, we have the Comté without holes. After we have the Gruyère, with uh, small holes after the uh, Gruyère, pardon, le, le Gruyère, oui. After we have Emmental with bigger holes, and uh, we have cheese, but which cheese? That is a problem. These consequences warn us that each archaeological record is linked to certain types of research questions. If the analysis remains strictly at the level of forms, and these forms are not longer suggestive of a tools in our knowledge register, we are faced with a situation where the artifact does not inform about itself. The information now comes only from the relationships between objects and none from objects that are considered lead. Second, we know that an object is only a part of the milieu. Milieu is a French word that allow it to exist in other worlds. It is a being who exists only among his own, as Gilbert Simondon says, since 60 years ago. The associate milieu of a pen, for example, is a table, a chair, people, clothes, bottle, paper, books, library, window, pieces, a lot of things. If I take another example, a car exists, only exists exists among its own. He is uh, to be among his own. Coming back to the Bergson cone, an object among its own which from, forms a system. Each object has a memory. It's like agglomerated and shared memories. Three. 
to access, access this memory, which can only be technical. And the need to question how to do, how to access this epiphylogenetic memory, even fragmented. What temporal information carries the object? We can see several temporalities. First, the temporality of its own life, the fruit of the experience, an individual memory, that of the knowledge of the gesture that produced and made possible the operation of the object. Ma more, an object has many lives. Object of production, sacred object, object of consumption, object of use, symbolic object, and for us, technical subject, c'est-à-dire technical, technical genetic approach, which will be for us the solution for the long-term work. Now, I take an example. Here we have the man or woman with a brain, and these people as technical objective, producing clauses as to do with use, consumption, sacred, etc. Let's see what is really key at stake. The first step is acquisitions. For that, we need knowledge, hunting technique, type of hunting tools, production mode, know on hunting technique, realization of tools. We need transformation. For that, we need knowledge, skin treatment, specific type of tools, production mode, etc., etc., etc. After we have the production, and for the production, we need also another knowledge, skin work, type of tools, production modes, and now on closing manufacturing, realization of tools, etc. In fact, we need a toolbox for each step. Now the question is about the materiality of the artifact. In fact, the question is, what is the artifact? And for that, we have two ways. The first way is the artisanal conception. An artifact carries a set of techno-functional constraints, which translate into a specific structure that can be broken down into different parts. It's very simple. We have the prehensive part and energy reservoir part. We have transmitting part. We have transformative part. And we have also the transformative contact. If we compare with the knife, the color are the same. Donc, it's very simple to understand this shape. Here we have a historical instrument. It's an Aborigen knife come from Australia. And uh, like we have prehensive part, pre we have transmitting part, and we have transformative part. And here we have just the cutting edge, the transformative contact. It's very important. Often we forget this part, the transformative contact. It's uh, like if you want to, to cut without a knife. Uh, if we knife can't cut, it's not a problem for your knife. It's a problem of just this line, the transformative contact. So it's very, very, very important part, but it's very difficult to observe this part on the archaeological artifact. Now the second conception. What is a tools? What is a tools? I don't use artifact. I use now tool. And for that, I need an ergonomic conception. 
For the ergonome, a tool is not just one artifact. It's an artifact and shame of use and energy. Another way of representation of that, we have artifact, we have subject, we have the working material, and we have a relationship network between artifact, subject, subject working, working artifact, and all that in the natural milieu, in life space. And we have another constraints is the energy and the action. Donc, the double technofunctional constraints carried by the tools, first on the artifact, and the second of the shame. First constraints carried by the artifact. Linked to the technofunctional constraints of instrumentalization. The artifact is built in a network of relationship with the subject, the working material, and the life space. And we have the double relationship. Now, the second constraints carried by the shame of use, linked to the technofunctional constraints of instrumentation. In this case, the artifact, through actions, supports a second network of relationship with the subject the working material and the lift spaces. Imagine you want to buy shoes. It's evidently the shoes it's to walk. Often you forget that and we have a problem because we buy, you buy an artifact, but you don't buy a tools because if you want walk in the mountain, for example, you need a specific constraints in the constraints of the action. Second problem of the temporality, the problem of the transmission by a group of heritage of a culture. In this case, we must distinguish two time scales. First, that on the object on lifespan, the one that allows it to exist. The second, it will be that on the lineage to which it belongs on the place in occupies serine. The first. In fact, it's classical concept of the shell operatoire. With hierarchies, perception, we have the step of the production in the manufacturing. We have the step of the desire. We have the step of we drive. Donc, uh, in fact, the car without driver is not a tool. A car without driver, it's artifact. A car with a driver, it's a tool. After the, the car, it's not alone. There is another car. There, are, there is another object. After we have another possibility, the object can be a waste here. And at the end, if I think at Duchamp, uh, can be uh, art, object art. Why not? For example, Ferrari, Lamborghini, it's classical. Now we have another temporality, the temporality of the lineage. That is very important. Example of the lineage, we take an example of the lineage with a car was operating principle is a combustion engine. For example, voilà, a car of uh, 2020. The present object of 2020 only exists because it belongs to a lineage. It is the descendants of plot car use the same 
principle. And the next question, does an object only exist because it is at a given point of time or because it belongs to a lineage? Now, according to Simondon, an individual, the constituted object, can only be apprehended through its genesis, not that of its material existence, but that of its becoming existences. Every object is therefore both the result of an individuation, that is to stay of an individuality, of its own and a becoming individuing. Thus, the understanding of an object must be done from the criteria of genesis to, defini to define the individuality and specificity of the technical object. An individual technical object is not such and such as type, as things, something given ik and not, but something that has a genesis. Technological law. In fact, law, it's a metamorph metamorph metaphorical sense. The evolution towards the greater synergy of the constituent elements of each of its parts. We are moving from an additional structure and we have evolution to integrate structure, going towards a functional synergy of all the elements, components of the tools, artifact and shame of use. The evolution, excusez-moi, voilà. For example, example of the simple additional structure. I use the debitage and I produce flex, just flex. And uh, with this gesture, I'm sure to produce a cutting edge. And the cutting edge on this picture is green. In fact, with this cutting edge, I can cut, scrape, and other things. And in fact, I don't need the other part of the, art, the artifact to cut. And this part can be, have a different morphology. So it's not a problem. So you understand, uh, I can, it's possible to have this form or this form or this form. All these three elements have the same type of cutting edge that it's typical additional tools. At the opposite, when we have integrated structure, it's not just after, we have different steps between uh, to, to be integrated. We have, for example, three types of tools of artifact and matrix. For example, here we have typical Levalois point and the morphology and the different technical characters are very important, are present. Like it's not just the morphology, but for us, it's, more, it's easier to recognize this artifact by the morphology, but there is another constraint. So it's typical, voilà. all the artifacts are like that. We have another type of tools, it's elongated tools, and uh, we have a convergence work. And here it's another type of tools. And uh, you observe that if you use just the morphology, for you, it's, you can categorize and you can put the difference between the three slides or the three pictures. That is not the same of that, that is not the same of that. 
Donc, in this case, the form is one of the structuring elements of the artifact, but not of the tools, because there can be different types of tools and the same types of support. It's the notion of matrix. I, I don't want to speak about that because uh, I'm all too, too much more time to explain. But in reality, we must do the difference between artifact, matrix, and tools. From these reading modes, we can follow through time different lineage of artifact, different lineage of tools, and different lineage of production. Now, this does not mean that the trajectory of each of these lineage are the same. Far from it. This is why we'll, we'll talk about coevolution. The technical artifact is both constitutive and constitute of the human. Knowledge of the artifact replaces man and human at the earth of what makes human, humanity. In a way, it gives a key to the making of the humanity. Now, the last, the four point. We are faced with a double constraint, the double ego, the ego of prehistoric man and woman, and the ego of the prehistorian. We see the object as a mirror. Through it, we project our service. Or what is the same? We try to question the object with questions that it cannot always answer. Concluding reflection. Là, excuse me, but life is too complex for me. I need to speak in French, but we have all the translation of my talk. Si la mémoire est la trace des possibles, c'est dans le cas présent la trace d'un passé porté par la matière qui nous révèle l'existence d'une mémoire qui a laissé des traces. Mais cette mémoire ne nous a pas été transmise, puisque l'artefact a été réalisé hors de notre temps, c'est-à-dire hors du réel observant et analysant, une réalité à jamais passé. Nous nous retrouvons devant la difficulté de nous dire que si l'artefact porte en lui des stigmates techniques, et si ces stigmates sont les traces de l'application de connaissances et de savoir-faire, transmis grâce à la mémoire, dans le cas qui nous préoccupe, cette mémoire n'est plus une trace, puisqu'elle a été effacée par le temps. Et pourtant, l'artefact a perduré à travers le temps et se retrouve à présent réobservé dans un présent qui n'est plus le sien, mais qui le projette dans le champ spatio-temporel d'une analyse. Nous sommes confrontés à un problème d'ordre gnoséologique. Il ne suffit pas de dire que l'artefact porte en lui une mémoire épiphylogénétique, car il s'agit d'une vérité, et si elle est nécessaire, elle n'est pas suffisante. En effet, la transmission de la mémoire a été interrompue, faute au temps, à l'oubli, aux possibilités restreintes de la retrouver. Il s'agit de la même situation vis-à-vis d'une écriture antique dont nous possédons la trace, mais plus le sens. D'où la question du « de quoi » que nous formulons ainsi. De quoi l'histoire d'une trace sans mémoire est-elle l'histoire Mais avons-nous un jour posé cette question du « de quoi » Ne nous contentons-nous pas de répondre aux seules questions plus simples du « qui »,« quoi »,« comment ». L'archive archéologique n'est plus qu'un lieu, une réalité, où le « je » du sujet a disparu, s'est dissous. Il est devenu « il »,« lui »,« l'autre ». En d'autres termes, le « je » a changé de porteur, suite à une altération spatio-temporelle 
où s'est mis en place un double jeu. Le jeu du protagoniste est devenu le jeu de l'observateur. Le moi-jeu de l'observateur face à l'observé. Ou pour le dire autrement, face à ce qui est regardé et qui nous regarde. Autrement dit, l'artefact en soi, vécu par celui qui l'a produit, est une sorte de noumène extérieur à notre réalité sociétale, mais objet d'étude, il est devenu phénomène tel qu'il nous apparaît à nous savants. Il reste un objet archéologique à valeur épistémologique, mais le sujet se trouve effacé, changé au cours du temps. L'artefact devient le produit d'une construction intellectuelle œuvrant à une nouvelle épistémée soumise aux aléas du temps, des hommes et de l'espace. D'où la question de savoir comment nous pouvons nous trouver dans deux épistémées à la fois, celle de l'homme et de la femme de la préhistoire, et celle du préhistorien. Ou, dans une troisième, celle d'une médiance, d'un entre-deux possible, entre spatialité et temporalité. Merci pour votre attention.